So let's open our Bibles to 1st of John, chapter 4, verse 1. And then we'll pray. We read the word in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit of the Lord. Amen. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Praise be the name of Jesus. Tonight, this, this uh, message we'll be looking at is titled, Test the Spirits and Overcome by Faith. Test the Spirits and Overcome by Faith. Now, for those who understand, there is another word for spirits, but th that's on a different thing. And we're not talking about that thing. You know, we're not talking about the, the hard drinks or the hard alcohol, because there's drinks that are called spirits as well. We're not talking about those types of spirits. But we are talking here about what John wrote. And John wrote and said to the believers, he said, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Now, when John writes all this, we have to remember that the early church, the primitive church, they went through a lot of difficulties. Paul, Peter, John, Timothy, Titus, all of them went through trials and tribulations and persecutions and betrayals of brethren, but also there were false prophets. And this is what John also spoke about. Because you see, there was also false doctrines that were being given too. And these were battles that they were going through because there was people that were actually coming and trying to steal away the flock by giving false doctrines and false teachings and false prophesyings. And that is why, brethren, it is so important for us especially in these times that we're living in, to know the teaching that Jesus Christ gave. The teaching which is also known as the doctrine of Christ. Because another word for teaching is doctrine. So whenever you see in the Bible that it says doctrine, you can replace the word with teaching, because the same word, teaching, is doctrine. So, he says here, not to believe every spirit. Because you see, when there are people that sometimes they may have an evil spirit and the spirits can talk in different tongues too and sometimes it's not just about talking in tongues sometimes it could even be that there is somebody who has a different like let's just say for example somebody could be uh, trying to prophesy something but how do we know if it's coming from God or coming from the devil or coming just from the mind of that person and this is what the Bible shows us, enables us through the scripture. When we know the scripture and we're very well founded and, and uh, we have that good and strong foundation in Christ Jesus to know when it's the Lord, when it's not the Lord. Blessed be the name of Jesus. And so we are told as the title of this message, test the spirits and overcome by faith. Because, well, John said many false prophets are gone out into the world. You see, many times when we think about the false prophets or the many false prophets, we sometimes can easily think about, you know, different types of religions because obviously there was a message supposedly about some form of salvation that came to them and they believed in that religion. For example, you know, there are religions, for example, like Buddhism. You know, Buddhism will tell you that they believe in a specific type of, for them, there's a specific type of teaching which takes you to a higher plane of existence and that teaching has come to them through buddha so buddha has become to them like a type of christ but then you've also got and obviously when you compare that to christianity we can say okay well i know definitely you know those who know a bit of scripture will say i know that that's definitely not the same but when you start looking at other sort of religions who kind of start to look a little bit the same for example, when you compare it to Islam, Islam will say, Jesus, oh yes, peace be upon him. I believe in Jesus too. But 
when you start looking at all the fine detail, they, they, they believe in Jesus in a different way. Because to them, Jesus is just a prophet. He's not divinity. There was no Christ in Jesus. We know him as Jesus the Christ. Because we know him as Christ who came down from the throne and he was given a body in the form of Jesus. It's why we call him Jesus Christ. And apart from that, there's also what he did, what his purpose was when he came down to earth. The purpose was to give salvation to all who believe in him, in that sacrifice that was done at the cross of Calvary. But in the Islamic faith, you'll find that they'll say, no, Jesus was never crucified. He ascended up into heaven and God, who is up in heaven, actually made people believe that somebody else was Jesus. And they hanged him instead. They crucified him instead. But the actual Jesus was not crucified. So, so there's these differences, you see. And for those who do not know doctrine, those who do not, are not very well founded, can, can be led astray by false prophets. False doctrines. And that is why John says to us that we need to test the spirits to see if they are from God. And the way that we can test the spirits is that we need to know the word of God. And we also need to have the Spirit of God dwelling in us too. Blessed be the name of Jesus. And just like, for example, if we then look at the Roman Catholic Church, it's like a little bit more similar. Because they also will say, yes, Jesus ascended into heaven. And yes, Jesus is the Christ. So we'll be like, okay, well, you know, these ones are a little bit more, yeah, like oh, the way I believe. But there will be all these little differences. And you're like, wait a minute. And this is where... We need to understand where we stand. That's where we need to know Jesus. That's, where, that's why we need to have that relationship with Jesus. That's why we need to know Jesus Christ ourselves. That's why we need to experience Jesus for ourselves. Because these things come. And sometimes they come through people who are very well studied. People who have studied psychology. People who have studied uh, a lot of different things. And they've studied geology and they've studied, studied uh, theology. So they might come to you with a whole bunch of different theologies that you might not have read about. And you know what that brings many times? Confusion. But this is why the Lord tells us that we need to test every spirit. Whether it is from God. To see whether it is from God or not. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And so then... We also see that there's also the false, you could say, prophets within the individual. They might not be prophesying something. They might not be saying, oh, look, this is a new religion that I'm bringing up. No, but there is a false prophet within themselves. And we're going to have a look into that a little bit right now. You see, because a good question would be, how do I know if the spirit in the person who's talking to me or in the person that I'm looking at or in the person, you know, in the, in the other person, how do I know if that spirit is from God? Good question, yeah? Well, let's look at verse 2 and verse 3, right here in the first of John. It says to us, Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. This is how you know it's the Spirit of God that's in the person. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Now, this, that somebody will confess and say, yes, I believe Jesus Christ has actually come in the flesh, is actually talking about doctrine. Because part of the teaching is that Christ, part of the divinity, the oneness with God, came was given a body in the form of Jesus and that is why we know him as Jesus Christ but then this Jesus Christ who is Messiah who is the Savior of the soul for all those who receive him as Lord and Savior was crucified he actually died but rose again on the third day as he said because there was the fulfillment of the scripture of all those prophets who came beforehand announcing that there would be the Messiah, the Christ that would come 
and that he would fulfill all of those prophecies. That's why we have, for example, like in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, where it says, Behold, it says, a, 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 um, a, a child is born unto you, and above him will be the government, and he will be called everlasting father. All of these prophecies were talking about the Christ who was set to come. About the Messiah. In, Greek, in the Hebrew, his name is it's Messiah, but in the Greek, it's Christ which is the Savior, the Anointed One, the one that God has chosen to give this great victory of salvation for all humanity. And so we see, brethren, as well, that when we're looking at what this verse told us in going back to 1 John chapter 4, verse 2, he says, Hereby know ye that the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. So if it agrees with Scripture, if it agrees, if the person who is talking agrees the fact that, you know, Christ, being divinity, came down, took on board a form of a body of human being, lived among us, fulfilled prophecy, died on the cross, is the way, only way to salvation. All of this has to do with somebody who is confessing and saying, yes, I believe that that's the case. If that's the case, yes, that comes from God. But what happens if somebody says, yes, I believe that Jesus came down from heaven, but he, uh, he was not divine. There was no divinity. He died on the cross and finished everything, and that was it. Is that from God? No, that spirit is not from God. Why is it not from God? Because he's saying he believes it's Jesus and Christ. But he's saying it's not divinity. So we have something mixed up here. God does not go against his own word. So when there is a mixed up in the scripture or in the prophecies or in the interpretation of the scripture, that's how we know it's not from God. And that can be somebody coming up to you to give a word of uh, prophesying. And that can also be somebody who's uh, speaking something else. But if it doesn't confess that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh and is of, is not, that is not of God. You see verse 3. Let's go to verse 3. It says, And every spirit that confesseth not, so if it does not confess this, if it's not spot on with the doctrine of Christ, the teaching of Christ, he says, And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. You know, these days there's a lot of people that they will like to twist scripture and doctrinal points for personal convenience. And I'll give you some of them. Some people say there's no soul. Well, if there's no soul, there's nothing to save. If there's nothing to save, then why did Jesus die on the cross? You see how it all adds up? Even though we're not really talking about the sacrifice of Jesus. But if we're trying to pinpoint at this part of doctrine, whether we have a soul or not, well, that has an impact with Jesus Christ because he's the center of it all. If we say that Jesus Christ was not divinity, if he's not divine then that means he cannot give salvation. And if he can't give salvation, what was the point of him dying at the cross of Calvary? So you see, it goes outside of Scripture. So that is a different spirit. When we look at also, some people will say, there's no hell. You know, I believe everything else. They can say, I believe everything else you believe, brother. I believe everything else you believe, sister. Just one thing, I don't believe there's hell. Because I don't believe God will be that bad. So people will say that to you. But what they're actually doing there is that's actually something that's different to the doctrine of Christ. That's actually a different teaching. And when you look at the impacts of somebody not believing that there is a hell, well, you know what? They believe that they'll just get a slap on the wrist by God in the, in the end times. God will say, oh, you, I'm just so full of love that I'm just going to let you ride into heaven. And that's why people take it easy. That's why people don't want to preach the gospel out there to anybody. That's why there's a lot of people that have taken it so easy that now, hey, there's no more sin. Because everybody can do what they want because, hey, there is no hell. We don't have to worry about that. God loves us so much that there is no hell. Can you see that how that affects what Jesus Christ did on the cross for us? 
where the Bible even shows us that Jesus Christ condemned. It says he condemned the, the sin in the flesh. Let's read that. Romans chapter 8 verse 3. So you see, if we start taking away parts of the doctrine, no matter which part it is, it all comes back to affect the main part, which is Jesus Christ. And if it affects the main part, which it does, then we're basically entering a different spirit and we're not confessing that Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh because we're denying the whole grand work of what Jesus came to do. We're denying the fact that Jesus actually preached about and he actually warned people that there is a hell. And he gave many examples about it too. And all of these things that we're denying the fact that he, that there is a resurrection, that he resurrected even um, Lazarus and all the other people that he resurrected. So we start to then deny all those things and we start to then go contrary to the doctrine, to the scripture, and we become false prophets as individuals. Because if we start to then say that to other people, we start to become false prophets. May God help us. But may God help us so that we can help other people in the right direction, brethren. Have a look at this. It says, for what the law, that's talking about the law of Moses, yeah? Because remember, the law of Moses came to point out when God gave the law of Moses, law to Moses, that is, when God gave the law to Moses up in Mount Sinai, that law was so that the people of Israel can govern themselves in a civil manner, so that they can have a moral manner to govern themselves. And they can also have a ritual manner so that the things that pertain onto the sacrifices, onto the Lord, that they can have um, the way to govern themselves. Now, it's actually talking about that law. And it says, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, because the people would basically become... A people that they'll be like, oh yeah, I've sinned, um, I'm just going to go and uh, sacrifice a lamb. But they didn't repent from their heart. It's like saying they knew the process. It's like God says to do this, this and this, and then he'll repeat, you know, he will actually um, pardon your error. But that person would go right back and do the same thing because they were not actually truly sorry for what they did. There was no real repentance there. And that can even happen in these times too. How can it happen in these times that we're living in, brethren? It can happen in the case where, you know, we come to church and we're, we sing a few songs and we hear the message. But when we go out the door, everybody's still fighting each other. Everybody's still practicing all those things that God says he doesn't like us to do. So if we've not changed, then we become just like those people. But you see, that's why Jesus Christ came. Because when we truly have the blood of Christ flowing through our heart and our veins, brethren, it says, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Not that Jesus Christ was sinful, but he was given a body. And as he was given a body under, you could say, the lineage of Adam, because that's where man came from, man and woman, from Adam and Eve. But when Adam sinned, that's why we all grow old. That's why we all have a, a, a day where we die from this earth. And that's why Jesus Christ, he grew from being a child to being an, a youth to being an adult. But also, obviously he didn't, he didn't grow old and die because he had a task that he had to complete. And that was salvation for your soul and mine and everyone else who believes in his name. But it says, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that's why someone who had no sin but given a body of sin took on board all of our sins upon that flesh and it condemned sin in the very flesh in the very body that he was given why to overcome sin to defeat sin and the power of sin which is death and that is why, brethren, that when the Bible says that he was dead for three days, rose again on the third day, but when he died, he descended down into the depth of the earth. But you know what happened? Death could not hold him down. Death could not have dominion over him. That is why, as he said, I will rise again on the third day. I lay my life down and I will raise it again on the third day. Blessed be the name of Jesus Christ forevermore. 
And you know why that happened? Because there was no sin found in him. So therefore there was no uh, strength in the law for death to hold him. Because the strength of death is the law. Because remember the law points out and it says this is sin. And if there is sin that is found, then death has a grip. It's got strength. It's got an authority. And that authority was given by the law. But because Jesus Christ had no sin, death could not hold him down. Death had no power over him. Praise be the name of Jesus. Such a great victory God has won for us. Praise be the name of the Lord. And so we see, beloved brethren, that there are even, you know, for example, in the, in the world today, there are even churches that they call themselves Pentecost churches too. There's a lot of churches out there. And this is not to attack churches or anything like that, but it's just so we are aware, brethren, because the Bible is telling us that we need to be aware not to believe every single spirit or moving of the spirit, but we are to test the spirit. We are allowed to do that. The Bible says to us that we can do that. But not doing it in a way where we're going to be looking at somebody to sort of say, you know, no, we're doing it in a way where we analyze. It, when it says test, you can put the word in there that says analyze. To analyze something is that you're looking at something or you're hearing something going on and you're saying to yourself and you're filtering it through your filter in your mind and you're filtering it in the filter of your heart and you're filtering it with the word of God. To see if it passes the checks of the word of God, brethren. And so when we're looking at that, where it says, you know, there's a lot of Pentecostal churches where some Pentecostal churches, they don't even preach against sin anymore. And they call themselves Pentecostal church. You know, I, had a, a, I think I mentioned here once where there was a person that I uh, ministered the word to who's from New South Wales. And he was going to a church over there. And he was saying to me that, you know, he had this very, very big problem that when he went and talked to somebody, because it was a sinful problem, but it had to be dealt with. But when he went and spoke to one of the one of the pastors that was assigned, because it was one of those, you know, really, really big church. So they have to assign sometimes deacons and different pastors, and then you've got like a senior pastor, which is the main pastor. So it's a structure, and God permits that. But in this particular case, he went and spoke to that pastor, and he said to him, look, don't mention any of that. And he just wanted to put it all under the rug. But the guy was there battling spiritually because he's like, well, what do I do? And when you, when, you, when you run into situations like that, brethren, we can't stop preaching against the sin. Because you see, that goes against the whole purpose of why Jesus Christ came. Because Jesus Christ came and he says, he, it says there that he condemned sin in the flesh. He has told us that there is a warning, that there is a, there is a punishment for sin. And we need to deal with that sin in our lives. And if we're taking away the fact that if, if we're not going to preach about sin anymore or against sin, then that's why you also take away, you see how one thing takes away from the other. Because if we're not going to say anything about sin anymore, then that takes away the cross. How does it take away the cross? Because Jesus said, if you want to be my disciples, take up your cross daily. Deny yourself and follow me, he said. And what does that mean to deny myself? That means I've got to deny the fleshly desires. Because this, this flesh wants to go crazy, wants to do what it wants to do. And there's no limit to what it wants to do. And it doesn't care about God's laws. It just wants to do what it wants to do. That's called sin. And, and it, it wants to, you know, uh, indulge itself in the pleasures of the world. But the pleasures of the world and the pleasures of the flesh are an enemy of God. And that is why, brethren, God tells us that we need to, you know, carry our cross. A lot of people like to carry a cross, you know, like a, a, on their here or here. Some people tattoo it on. But that's not the cross that God's talking about. The cross is a spiritual cross. Jesus said it very clearly. He said, if you want to be my disciples, yeah, if we truly want to be a disciple of Jesus, he said, carry your cross daily. He says, deny yourself. So denying ourselves means that I need to deny my fleshly pleasures of what, I, what my flesh wants. 
I need to deny myself of where I want to go and, 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 I, and the Bible and the Spirit of God is telling me, no, nope, that's not for you anymore. No, nope, you can't be doing that anymore. No, nope, you can't be saying those things anymore. And you see, that's what a lot of people don't like. Because God starts to put a lot of stop signs. But that's because He's leading us on the path that leads to salvation and eternal life. But a lot of the times we're stuck with what we want to do. And we want more of what we want to do than what God wants us to do. And that's the problem. That's the battle between the flesh and the spirit. And God says in the word that the flesh and the spirit have a live battle so that we do not do the things that we want to do. Because I'll tell you what, if God doesn't step in and stop us, we end up like Sodom and Gomorrah. That's the truth of it. Or worse, because now we've got technology and we've got a lot of things that spreads even faster. So we end up worse than Sodom and Gomorrah if God doesn't step in and, and, and warn us and tell us. But praise be the name of the Lord, because he, His intention for us is and always has been salvation. How good, like the good father that He is. I'll share a short testimony with you, brethren. You see, on the week, during the week today, it goes hand in hand with what we're talking about too. Because... You see, I met this person who was walking down the street and he was drunk. And he's walking down the street and he starts asking and he goes, Oh, do you know what street this is? Because he was, he was half on the phone and he was waiting for somebody. He was trying to get directions because he was trying to tell whoever it was on the phone where he was so that they could come and pick him up. Because apparently he wanted to go to the casino. Worldly things, brethren. And he was all drunk. And so when he's asking questions, he's like, Oh, do you know what street this is? Oh, it's such and such. And he realizes that I'm handing out pamphlets. He goes, Oh, what's this? It's like, This is a message of salvation in Jesus Christ. Oh, hey, I'm here talking to somebody who's talking about Jesus, this and that. And because he was drunk, he wasn't really making sense. But then I start, <laughs> I start saying to him, because he was saying, Oh, I'm talking to a guy who's talking about Jesus. And he goes, Tell him that they need to tell him. I'm talking about the good news. Oh, he says he's talking about the good news. It's about Jesus Christ's salvation. And he says it's about Jesus Christ's salvation. And he goes, tell your friends they need to repent. And you go, you need to repent. Boop. He goes, all of a sudden, the line hung up. And I said to him, oh, I think your friends hung up. I don't think they like that message. <laughs> Praise be the name of Jesus. And then, you know what, because he was drunk, and we were kind of like on the side of the road, almost, on the corner, I ended up, uh, he ends up going, oh, yeah, look, uh, oh, Jesus, and I start talking to him. And at first, he was okay with it. He didn't realize what happened, but, you know, the world doesn't like Jesus. That's why his friends hung up. And I hope he realizes that one day, when he, when he, when he becomes, you know, when he, when he sobers up. Because... You see, when we start to proclaim Jesus, when we start to walk the path with Jesus, straight away the world will go, hey, I don't know you anymore. <laughs> I don't know that spirit. Because that's Jesus Christ. And so you see what happened was that he then started saying, oh, yeah, yeah, I know how to represent. I know how to represent. So he asked me for a few tracks. And then he started licking it and putting it on the front of a bus that was there. And the bus was beep, 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 trying to get him to move and everything. And he's going, wow, 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 it's the message, it's the message I'm representing. But brethren, there's a lot of people in churches that want to represent Jesus Christ. But does it mean that Jesus will accept that? Because the man's drunk, and the Bible says no drunk will enter into the kingdom of heaven. And at the same time, he's going there and he's creating this thing, which is, you know, but God knows how he does his things, you know. So I'm there, as the Bible says, in the spirit of peace. He asked me for some tracks. I gave him some tracks. He's gone and putting them on there. And then he waits for the next set of lights to stop. And then he goes on there. You know, kind of like those people that wait for the lights to stop. And they ask you if you want your windscreen cleaned. So he was doing something similar to that. But instead of asking, he was actually just going. And he was putting it on the front of people's, um, you know, just lifting up the windscreen. Putting it on there. And people were beeping going. And then it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm representing. I'm representing Jesus. And then he comes up to me and he says, you see, I can represent Jesus better than you. <laughs> I wasn't going to argue with him because he wasn't in his right mind. And hey, if God is doing something there through him and he doesn't realize it, what he doesn't realize now, hopefully he'll realize it tomorrow. Because then those tracks, when some of them...
fell on the floor and then the wind brushed them away. You see another people over there, they're like, oh, they pick it up. They see that it's the message of Jesus. They put it in their pocket and they go walking. So we don't know how God is going to use all this, brethren. But then all of a sudden, that person who was okay with Jesus and me talking about Jesus, all of a sudden turned again. That's like, that's, what, that's normal for people who have been drinking, you know. So if you ever run into somebody and you're spreading the gospel, don't worry about that. They're with you one minute and then they turn against you the next minute. All right, so then he turned against me the next minute. And the next minute when he turns against me, he's like, oh, well, I've got some questions for you. Can you convince me that God is life? And then he goes, that God speaks. And I said, yes, God speaks. Well, how does he speak to you? What did he say? And I said to him, well, when God spoke to me and he revealed himself to me, it wasn't through anybody else. He revealed himself to me. He said to me, either you serve me or you'll be deaf and blind for the rest of your life. And he swore at me and he says, God does not talk like that. That's not God. That's not him. And I said, well, can you tell me what God would say then? Because obviously if I don't know God, maybe this man does. And he says, God would actually say to you, Jesus would say to you, live your life. Go have fun. Go and live, live it up. And I'm in my mind going, yeah, that sounds like the other one. But you see, that's the way the world is. The Bible says to us that those who are not in Christ, the devil has them under his sway. And he really believed the fact that he would, that, that Jesus would say to him, go to live your life. Do what you want to do. And so therefore, this is the moment, brethren, that when people approach us in that false prophet, in that false spirit, because basically that's a spirit of antichrist. The spirit of antichrist says to, to the person, go and do what you want. Live your life. You be your own God. That is the spirit of antichrist. That is the false prophet that is out there, brethren. That is why people don't want to repent. Because they want to do what they want to do. They want to indulge in their sins. And they don't want anyone to tell them that it's sin. They want to say, they want people to say to them, No, you're right. You're right. You're doing the right thing. And these are the moments, brethren, when we have to stand down ground. And when he started saying to me, No, God would say this, this, this. No, he wouldn't. That is the voice of the devil. And then you have all these other swearing again. And he's like, no. Oh. And he started to make me think that I've been brainwashed by the government and who knows what else. And those are the moments, brethren, where we need to stand our ground and overcome the false spirit of the world, the false spirit of Antichrist in that firmness because we know the doctrine and we need to preach that doctrine and have faith in the Lord because we're not battling against flesh and blood there. He's being used by the one who's behind him. And when we realize that, brethren, we can preach in boldness and, we, and, and he's coming at us in a spiritual manner, trying to shut us down, trying to, um, uh, what's the word? He's trying to intimidate with his swearing, with his posture, with everything. But we come to him in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. And when we come in the name of the Lord and we say, no, nope, that's not Jesus, that's the devil. And the devil is what Jesus said. He's taking people to hell. But God doesn't want people to go to hell. God wants people to go to heaven. And that's why we need to repent. Because without repentance, there is no salvation. And so in the end, brethren, when all of this tug and fro was going through, his friends called him again. Or I think he called his friends. And he goes, oh, where are you guys? Oh, I'm still here. And I'm actually arguing now. Okay, so now they didn't hang up on him. Because now they were happy to hear that he's arguing with the, with the, with the, with the Christian, with the, with the God-speaking man. So now it's there. You know, that, that's what the world like. Yeah, 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 you give it to him. Yeah, you give it to him. We don't want to hear that. So the world knows its own. But when we step into Christ, the world doesn't know us because they don't know him. They don't know Jesus. My hope is that he will realize that when he becomes sober and he's like, hey, you know what? When I was talking about Jesus, people didn't look at me right. My friends hung up on me. But now, you know, and that's something that we've got to realize, brethren, that the world does not look down right on people when we talk about Jesus and we, when we tell them the truth. And more to it, they don't want to believe the truth. They rather believe the lie. Can you believe that? But even still, whether, you know, however that was going to go down, I wasn't going to back down, brethren. And we should not back down because if we're telling them the truth and we're guiding them to the truth, then it's not for us to back down. It's for them to actually 
humble themselves and listen to those who read the Bible. Blessed be the name of Jesus. So when we're looking at those situations, brethren, let's look at verse 6. Uh, sorry, when we go back to 1 John chapter 4, verse 6. It says, We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. See how interesting that is? Now this man at first was willing to hear, but then after that he wasn't willing to hear, but obviously he was under intoxication. So he that's of God hears us, but he that is not of God hears us not. Hereby we know, no we, the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So that's how we know if there's the spirit of truth in the person or a spirit of error. You know why? Because when there is somebody who has the spirit of truth within them, they stop, they listen. Even though they're busy, but they'll listen to the gospel. Because they know that it's the word of God. They know that it's the truth. And the spirit of God is telling in them, hey, have some respect. It's God talking to you through the spirit. And I've had that happen many times. But when there's the spirit of error, they go against it. They, they, they want to fight against it. Because they, they want to fight against not having to repent. And that's how you know it's the spirit of error. And they'll make up all these excuses and reasons as to why they want to hold on to them. What are they trying to hold on to? They're trying to hold on to their sinful ways. That's what they don't want to repent from. But you see, later on on that same day, within about an hour's time, ran into an Aboriginal man. And how do you say to an Aboriginal man, look, um, I know you lost your land, but at the same time you should know that because of the witchcrafts and all the devil practices that were going on in your ancestry, that's why you have ended up in being slaves. Obviously there's a better way to say that. <laughs> and God gives the grace. God gives the grace. I'll tell you how it went down, how, how, how it was said. I said to him, I respect your people. I respect the Aboriginal nation. I love the Aboriginal people, and I really do. I'm not just saying that just because, because, you know, when you get to know them, you see a lot of similarities. And I said to them, and, and that's how I started talking to the Bible. And I said, you see, because I can respect the fact that about the slavery, how it happened. But you know, God, he didn't intend for anybody to be a slave. It was mankind who became slaves. And I started to preach to him. And he started to listen. And this is a man who was older than me. He was probably like maybe 50, 60 years old. But yet still, when talking to him and starting to say, you see, when God took the people of Israel out of Egypt and he brought them to the promised land, the land of Canaan, he said to them, I give you this land flowing with milk and honey. This is your land, your inheritance. I give this to you. And the people who are already inhabiting this place, I drive them out. Why is he driving them out? Because those were people who worshipped the devil. They had practices that were doing Satanism and worshipping false gods and devil gods. So that's why they were driven out. But God also said to the people of Israel, He says, Be warned and take heed to yourself that you do not follow the practices of the heathen, that you do not go after strange gods, because just now have I, as I have driven them out, before you, I will drive you out, just as you have driven them out. But the problem was that in maybe the first generation they would have obeyed, but then when the other generations came, it's like they forgot about what God said. And they didn't obey God. And they started to worship all these other pagan gods. And when God sent the prophets, they didn't want to listen to the prophets. And so therefore, when the time came, God permitted for another nation to come and invade and conquer them and kill some of them and drive them off as slaves. And you know what? This is all, all the things that I was saying to him. And I said, and you know what? That word of God is still true even to today. Because when I look at my ancestry, when I look at where we came from, for all those who came from, say, for example, you know, Central America and around those in the South America. When you look at the natives of that land, you're looking at the Incas, you're looking at the Mayans, you're looking at the Aztecs. 
When you look at what they worshipped, when you look at how they used to dress, they didn't really used to dress with much, did they? And they had these paintings on as well. And when you look at what they worshipped and how they worshipped and those ziggurats that they made and what they used to sacrifice up there, which were people, and they used to rip people's hearts out and offer it to some sort of snake. Well, yes, that's Satanism. And then we see in history how Christopher Columbus and all these other people came, invaded, they started to mingle, they started to bring these things, they started to take the gold, they started to conquer, and they became slaves. And when you look at countries like, I think it's like Honduras, I think was one of those countries, where you had people come in, a nation that was from far away, and they came in with these medicines and they said, we're going to help your people. But then when those mothers started to give birth to their children, the children came out deformed or mentally brain damaged. They were wiping out the next generation, brethren. That's what they were doing. And took them as slaves as well. When you then look at the other continent, Africa, how did they get so many you know, Africans up in, the, up, in, up in the United States, the African Americans there, in the Caribbean countries where you, when you go to, for example, when you go to um, Rep uh, Dominican Republic, those countries, the African, they look like Africans, but they all speak Spanish. Where did these people come from? Well, all these people came from, they were all dragged up there as slaves. And why? When you look at Africa and you look at the history in Africa, you can see that they practiced witchcraft as well. How did they used to dress? You see as well the same sort of rituals that they had. Paintings, and uh, you see that they hardly had any clothes. You see all the things, you know, some of the women, that they didn't put things on their breasts, and the men would just have like a leaf. All of that comes from those traditional practices and rituals that have Satanism in them. And that is why when they came to a certain time and there was no repentance, the word of God stands strong. And then I easily brought it through to Australia, Aboriginal nation. When you look at the traditional old Aboriginal nation, what do they have? Hardly any clothing, painting, the white that they do. They do the rituals. They have the serpent snakes. I, I did a little bit of research on that because even when I was growing up here, because I'm more Aussie than Central American. <laughs> But they, you know, I, I, I grew up reading about the Aboriginal culture and their gods. And uh, I, I saw that there was this big rainbow serpent. So all of those things, brethren, where did all this come from? And they have this, this strong belief about the dreaming. The dreaming, okay, well, we know about dreams too. We believe dreams too. But also as Christians, we believe that dreams can come from either God or come from either my mind or can come from the other guy. And when you start to see these things, brethren, you start to realize that after a time of following devil gods, there comes another nation, conquers and drags us off away as slaves. And you know what happens in the end? God in his mercy permits that to happen. You know why? Because many times we are so blind spiritually that we can't see. So God permits this to happen so that when they drag the person away physically as slaves, they have time to think. They have time to think as slaves. And they say to themselves, I worship this thing and look at what I am. And so that they can come to the realization that they were always slaves, but spiritually. Spiritually. And God is allowing them to see that. That they are spiritual slaves under the yoke of Satan. But because they did not realize it, and kept on serving Satan, that now they find themselves as physical slaves of other people, of other nations. And all of this I explained it to him. And you know what he said to me? I like the words you're saying to me. You see, brethren, when you see somebody who hears, it's because God is doing a work there. And there is a spirit of truth there. But when there is denial to the teaching, to the gospel, to the message of salvation, to want to protect my way of living, my way of sin, that is a spirit of error. That is a spirit of antichrist. But God teaches us, beloved brethren, that we are to defend the scriptures. We are to obey the word. We are to stand strong. 
Now, this is not to say that sometimes there's people that make mistakes because sometimes people can maybe not have enough knowledge of the word. Some people might be, you know, out of, out of due to ignorance, they might have been taught wrong, and that's unperfectly understandable. But when there's that spirit of truth, they will listen to the truth because it is the spirit of God flowing through and giving witness that it is His truth. Because we're not here to preach our truth. We don't have truth. Jesus is truth. And when we preach Jesus, He is the truth. And it is His Spirit, the Spirit of truth, that will guide the lives to the truth. So let's finish up with 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. And then we will come to the recess that we have. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. How do we overcome in all this? Well, John told us, that we should test the Spirit. How do we test the Spirit? We test the Spirit with the Spirit of God who is dwelling in us, but also with the knowledge of the Word of God through on what we see, what we hear, to see if that's of God. And we are to stand strong. The Word says to us, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Our faith, brethren, because many times... Those things that come against us, those false doctrines and false teachings come against our faith, come against what we've come to learn of the Word of God. And that's why we need to stand strong and firm in whom we have believed in. So that when these difficult times come and people come in all sorts of ways and forms, then we can stand strong and overcome the world. There are some people that are going to come and they'll say, oh no, but it's not, you know, it's not, it's not sin to... To go into this place and do this. It's no sin to go into a nightclub and enjoy the music that's there. It's not sin to be, you know, drinking uh, on a Friday and a Saturday night. That's not sin. So there'll be people that'll say all these things. And there'll be people that'll quote scripture as well. And that's where we need to stand strong in the scripture. That's where we need to know the doctrine of Christ. Because one of those things, uh, as we were saying before, you know, one doctrine that they try and take away, they're actually doing an attack. They're trying to do an attack on Christ Jesus. Because one thing always leads to another. And it always leads out of Jesus. And that's what the devil wants to do. Lead us away from Jesus. Because in Jesus, we are more than conquerors. In Jesus, we have salvation. In Jesus, we have all the blessing. But outside of Jesus, we're nothing. So that's the work of Satan. May the Lord rebuke him. But God speaks to us and gives us his wise counsel through his word. That we may overcome and this is what overcame the world, even our faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah.